this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, youth night starting. All right, and thanks to Stephen and Kayla, it's uh, expanded. All right, so before it was going to be from 12 to 19-ish, 12 and up, uh, but thanks to them, we're going to have the littles involved too. So it's going to be from 3 to 19. So, uh, what the plan is, September 8th, not this Wednesday, but next, we're going to eat at 6 o'clock, and then at 6.30, we're going to break up into small groups. Uh, if you know anybody that's interested, please share the word, but there's one way you can help. Uh, we need your prayer. Uh, if you could, please pray uh, with us on this. Uh, I pray that, uh, just like all the other ministries in this church, God's uh, in the center of it. Uh, but uh, with that, uh, let's see. CR on Tuesdays. He's, uh, God's really been working in that ministry lately. I suggest everyone to come. It's a really blessing thing. Uh, it starts at 6.30, or 6. And then eats at, uh, we eat at 6, and then uh, worship, and then uh, big group, small group. On 6.30, on Thursdays, we have prayer meeting here. Uh, it's a really good time. Y'all should come on. Uh, and then uh, there's a letter from Linda. Whenever uh, she came, she wrote a, church, or a letter to the church, and I'm going to read it to y'all. Asbury, you are an amazing group of people. May God be with you and bless each one of you as we continue to move forward. Each one of you are special. It was an honor to be with you. I see an advancement in your future. And God is pleased and blesses Pastor Jason with the power and anointing and truth that is much needed in this hour. Thank you for allowing me, allowing me to be with you. Love, Linda. All right, now, uh, so, well, all right, first off, we're going to do a noisy offering today, and I'm looking forward to that. So, all the kids, will you please come down and help me? I need your help desperately on this. Good job, guys. Uh, 
right, I even got more exciting news today. The nursery is open, guys. Uh, I'd like to give Ray a big thank you. So let's give her a round of applause. Ray's going to be going back to the nursery now. So uh, it's up to you. She'll be back there if you want the kids to go with her. If you want to stay in here, hey, that's great too, you know. But uh, give a big thank you to her. All right, uh, I need my Bible. All right, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your, ra ro your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, now, I'm going to ask Miss Sue to come and pray. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for this day. We thank thee for the many blessings that are ours to enjoy. And Father, just forgive us when we fail to stop and say thank you for the blessings that are already there for us. Father, we just ask you to be with each person here today. We just ask a hand of protection upon them. Be with the ones that are unable to be with us because of sickness. We just pray that you will touch them in a very special way. And Father, be with Miss Amanda today as she brings her song. And Father, just opening up our hearts and minds for the awesome sermon we're about to hear from Pastor Jason. Father, we just ask these things in your name. Go with us, grant us mercy, grant us grace. Always put you first and foremost in our life. Amen. Good morning. If everybody would stand this morning and just worship the Lord.
your power, Lord, come and live inside of me. with your power oh Lord come and live inside of me Quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. Hard be it for me to not believe. when my eyes can't see and this mountain that's in front of me I know will be thrown into the midst of the sea and through it all through it all my eyes are on you and through it all through it all it is well Through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well.
what it has in store. I will praise the Lord. doesn't matter what tomorrow brings or what it has in store. I will praise the Lord. Oh, I will love Him. I will love the Lord. Oh, tell Him this morning. Say, I will love the Lord. It doesn't What it has in store, I will love the Lord. Oh, I will serve Him. I will serve the Lord. Oh, yes, I will. I will serve the Lord. No, it doesn't matter. What it has in store, I will serve the Lord. Oh, let's praise Him this morning. I will praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord. It doesn't matter what tomorrow brings. What it has in store, I will still praise the Lord. Oh, I will serve Him. I will serve the Lord. Oh, yes, I will. I will serve the Lord. It doesn't matter what tomorrow brings. What it has in store, I will serve the Lord. One more time, let's praise Him. I will praise the Lord. Oh, yes, I will. I will praise the Lord. It doesn't matter what tomorrow brings. What it has in store, I will praise the Lord. It doesn't matter what tomorrow brings, what it has in store, for I will praise the Lord. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, Lord, we thank you for delivering us out of death and uh, redeeming us, forgiving us of our sins, Lord, and uh, we thank you for being here with us this morning, Lord. We thank you uh, for just speaking to us through your word. We thank you for your spirit, which is here, Lord. We thank you uh, that you have defeated every enemy that you have faced, and you are defeating our enemies, Lord Jesus. And so our prayer is, Lord, uh, that you would begin to do the miraculous in our lives here this morning, Lord. Begin to do the miraculous in our minds. Begin to do the miraculous in our hearts, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray, Lord, help us through your word to expose the lies of the enemy this morning, Lord Jesus. Help us to see how we've uh, become entangled in, in fear, Lord, and believe the lies and become depressed and angry and jealous, Lord. We recognize that by your help, Lord. We pray that you would allow us and empower us to move out of those things, Lord, and to live in a place of pure and true freedom, Lord, to where we have minds of power and of love and their sound, Lord, that we are made more than victorious in you, Jesus. 
And so, Lord, I pray, help me to preach this word, Lord Jesus. Help me to keep my focus on you, Jesus. To keep my eyes on you, Jesus. Lord, as we all shall, no matter what the world says, no matter what's around us, Jesus, we can look to heaven, Lord, and our sanity is restored. Our reasoning is restored. Our peace is restored, Lord Jesus. Restore it for us this morning. In your name we pray, amen and amen. You have your Bibles open to Daniel chapter 4. We are continuing in our series on spiritual warfare. Daniel chapter 4, the title of this morning's sermon is The Wounded Mind. Daniel chapter 4, starting in verse 28. It says, All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of twelve months. He was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power, as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws paints a vivid picture of a a wild man in a wild scene and strange surroundings, a a mind gone mad. And and actually this represents, I believe, uh, what a lot of us are experiencing here this morning, right? We're talking about spiritual warfare. Scripture gives us a framework to see ourselves in its narrative. We can find ourselves in a lot of the characters mentioned in Scripture, but it always points us to Jesus, the one who is perfect, our Lord and Savior. And we can find ourselves in the stories and narratives of a lot of these biblical people. Nebuchadnezzar, the insanity of his mind. And, And as you can see, that we all have wounded minds, right? Because we're all human, right? Uh, uh, For example, uh, uh, one illustration is that as a child, right, we learn that when we get angry, we push things away. The pain is pushed away. When we become angry, the threat is removed. And so through life, we become masters of anger, right? We learn that as a coping mechanism. We then become masters of jealousy, masters of envy, masters of pride, right? Masters of self-rejection. So we've all uh, got these wounded minds because we have these bodies of flesh and we're surrounded by a world full of lies, right? And we are influenced. And as a result, right, we're gathered here today, right? But we honestly have wounded minds, a lot of us do, because we believe the lies of the enemy for so long. And it's created fear in our lives. And that's how we act. That's how we respond. And so if you can imagine also, imagine that the world Everybody in the world, what if six, seven billion people, if everybody had a skin disease, there were open wounds, right? And we went around and we would be so careful not to touch anybody. But if somebody hit our wound, we could perhaps lash back, right? Because they've hurt us. Well, the reality is there's not a skin disease, but there is a disease of the mind. We retaliate. We lash out. We try to get even, right? And it's, it's all rooted in fear. And this fear leads to anger and selfishness and just selfish ambition and just bitterness and resentment and frustration, sadness, envy, and hypocrisy, right? And then all of humanity suffers because of the root of the spirit of fear, right? And also, we, uh, another example, we, we drink and drug ourselves so numb, right? Because we're escaping what we're afraid of. 
And then we go to the bar, another dope house, to find some other miserable souls that we hang out with. And we begin to share stories. And they understand us like nobody has ever understood us before. And we begin to numb ourselves to the pain. And then trouble comes. And we hurt one another. We go on down the road to the next group of friends that we can identify with and hurt. And the pain continues. Talking about spiritual warfare, talking about uh, this spirit of fear that's in our lives. And, and so it all begins with this spirit of fear, right? Uh, imagine girls trying to, to grow up, right? Trying to fulfill an image that they've seen, right? Through television, through movies, through social uh, media that tells them what beautiful is, right? We've got the world informing our daughters for the standards of beauty, right? Just images left and right. And so as a result, we're, we're worried about are we too fat? Are we too thin? Are we wearing the right stuff? Do we have the right clothes? Do we have the right makeup to be considered beautiful? Talking about a wounded mind. Talking about a wounded mind, right? That's, that's just trying to go around and please everybody and, and earn love. And, and you, you believe that nobody's going to love you unless you do these things. You learn to act seductive so that you can receive love. And you find a man and you're happy for a while, but it's not because that man is great. It's because that fear of not being loved is removed for a while. But then drama happens, you break up or something happens and then more pain and more suffering and you go out through the world to look for this love that the world cannot provide but only God can provide. Wounded minds. You've got these wounded minds, right? That uh, Absolutely, and I'm talking to Christians in here. I'm talking to Christ lovers and Christ followers that have wholeheartedly given your heart to Jesus and absolutely by uh, faith alone through, or by grace alone through faith alone, we receive salvation, right? There's no question about it, but spiritual warfare is about what do we do between now and the time we have a glorified body. Sanctification is what Scripture calls it, right? And it's about walking out of these lies. It's about walking out of fear. It's about receiving and believing the truth of Jesus Christ. Spiritual warfare. We've got these wounded minds, guys. I've got a uh, wounded mind. And, and we're going to look and explore about what that looks like, how it affects us, and how it has absolutely permeated our lives. We're filled with fear, and then before long, we become like Nebuchadnezzar. Out in the wilderness, a madman with wounded minds. We live in fear. We live in fear of not being loved. We live in fear of, of being hurt. And, and we can't even say, I love you, without having fear that we're going to get hurt because uh, we've said that, and we become such good liars, right, that we lied to ourselves in this this lie system is called denial, right? And so we've got this spirit of fear which operates in our lives. We're afraid to really show who we truly are to anybody else. We hold back, we reserve, and we check down, right? We don't allow our true selves, our true emotions, our true feelings, our true passions, our true faithfulness, our true love for God and others to emerge or shine through because we've had and developed these wounded minds throughout our entire lives. It's the world of throwing these ideologies at a school system, it's throwing these ide music, throwing ideologies, movies, throwing ideologies, neighbors, communities, saying that you're sufficient, you're enough, if you can do this and do that, if you can lose this and lose that, if you can gain this and gain that, you'll become somebody. But the Word of God says that's absolutely not the case because God loved you even when you were in sin and He pulled you out of that. Your life has value, meaning, and purpose. Power and love and a sound mind. Look at children. 
Look at children who just love to absolutely, they laugh and they love, right? I mean, they go wild, right? And we love them and they could be going wild in here if they were in the nursery, which is fine, right? But that's an absolute, maybe we should march them in here and see what an absolute expression of love and happiness is. Here's what happens to all of us. This is not bad parenting, this is just what happens. You're two or three years old, you love running outside and you're in the park and you're the happiest young boy or young girl that's ever been and you're thrilled and you're excited and you're running and you're with your, your mother who loves you and you go running but you don't realize there's traffic nearby. You've got this perfect expression of love and happiness and you're running, joy, everything's great and then your mom comes running at you eyes this big and is yelling at you and screaming at you and swoops you up and spanks you. It's probably the right response. I'm all for not sparing the rod and spoiling the child. But what I'm saying is this, for the child who doesn't understand about traffic, they realize, oh, when I express love, I get hurt. When I really express how I truly feel and joy, what I receive in return is a spank. What I receive is pain. Take another illustration. The same, or say you're two or three years old. You love your father and you're at home and, and you go into his study and you pick up his guitar and you start playing it. Daddy comes home and, and you see him come through the door, the, the one that loves you, the one that protects you, the one that provides for you, the one that gives you stability and strength, and he comes running right towards you, yelling, furious, mad, angry. You feel threatened. You feel threatened by the person that's supposed to be protecting you. Everybody does. It's It's humanity. It's these fleshly vessels. And so what happens as a young man, you realize that the person that's supposed to protect you doesn't really protect you and really hates you. And so therefore, when we think about God referred to as a good father, we struggle with that. We think it's a trap. We've got wounded minds. We've got wounded minds, guys. We're talking about spiritual warfare. I wish it was as easy as saying we can sprinkle some holy water on you or we can pull out a crucifix, right? And then all of your issues would be gone. All of the, the influences of darkness would be gone, but it's not quite like that. It's more authentic. It's more real. It's more powerful. And it requires a response from us, not for salvation, but to co-labor with Christ in sanctification talking about spiritual warfare, talking about the wounded mind that has affected us all. And so you go out through life and these feelings of happiness come from time to time and then you feel guilty when you express happiness and love as an adult. Like it shouldn't be that way. Like you feel you're happy and then you feel guilty for being happy. The wounded mind. This is a problem which plagues all of humanity Buddhism, Muslim, atheists, agnostics, right, and Christians alike. Widespread, the disease of the mind throughout all of earth, right? But only Jesus Christ gives us the answer. It's only Jesus Christ that we have freedom and can live. So what are we going to do? We've got these wounded minds. What are we going to do? Two things. The first thing is to become aware of it. Right, And that's what we're doing here this morning. We are awakening, right? We are awakening to the wounded mind. Scripture says to be not ignorant of the devil's devices there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Don't be outwitted by Satan for we are not ignorant of his design. Don't be ignorant of his devices. We need to be aware. Aware that, that fear and the spirit of fear has surrounded our life. Aware of the lies that we've believed with our lives. And also aware that nobody else can make us happy. I think I'm getting into some relationships here. But aware of the fact that nobody else can make us happy happy because honestly guys I'm going to speak about Jason Roop right here my whole MO throughout my whole life right find somebody find something that can make me happy 
whether it be a, a, you know, a relationship through a relationship, uh, or whether it be through achievements, right? Uh, come on now, or whether it be through, through drugs. It's always finding this thing outside of myself to make myself happy. The hunt needs to end. The hunt for happiness outside of Jesus Christ needs to end because He's the only one that can bring about uh, that happiness, joy and peace, true happiness, which is true peace and true joy. We surrender the hunt. The second thing we need to become aware of is this, uh, that we must take action. We've got to take action. There's a, and this is absolutely, I, I was talking to uh, our Sunday school teacher, Mark Hillard, this morning, talking about salvation, talking about uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, that Jesus saves us, right? But then in the process of sanctification, the time in between uh, where we're caught up by God and He's bringing us in, right? It's up to us to respond in certain ways. The Bible invites us into that. In the New Testament, there are a thousand and fifty commands. Be a people of prayer. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, the kingdom of, of heaven. And pray earnestly and don't forsake the widows. It's talking about uh, taking thoughts captive. A thousand and fifty commands. We've got, uh, we've got to respond in a certain way way, right? We don't just sit back in the boat, say, I've got my golden ticket to heaven stand. Let me just sit here, bring me some food, bring me some drink, right? Pass an offering plate here or there, and we're all good. No, that's not what Christ has called us into. He's called us in to do spiritual warfare for ourselves and for those we love. Spiritual warfare. Talking about spiritual warfare. We've got to respond the right way. Let's take another illustration. Let's say somebody comes up to you on the street and says, You're stupid! We've got a lot of options right here. We can get mad. We can punch him in the face. We can say, No, you're stupid. Or we can just ignore him and walk away. Talking about the wounded mind. What Christ invites us into is turning the other cheek. What Christ invites us into is turning the other cheek and realizing that the person that said that to you is not about you at all. It's because they have a wounded mind. It has nothing to do with you. So we've got to respond in, in the right way. And, and if we truly want to change, we have to do more than just sitting down in front of Netflix and watching show after movie after show after show after movie. Whatever you could be watching, we have to realize we have to apply the truths of God's Word in our lives. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some work. So what work? To heal from the wound in mind, we... We need to open the wounds. We need to open these wounds. And I don't know this morning. But the Holy Spirit does. We need to open these wounds. We need to have them cleaned out. And we need to have them clean until they're completely healed. And so what's the first thing that we've got to do? The first thing we've got to do is to absolutely open the wounds. And how do we do that? Number one, we do it through truth. We do it through truth. John 8, 31 says this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed Him, If you abide in My Word, you are truly My disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We've got this, our wounds are the denial system that we have. We've been hurt. We've covered those wounds with lies. We've covered those wounds with denial to protect further pain into those wounds. So we've got this big scab of denial that's over us right now. We've got this scab of denial that just, it comes about by just repeated trauma, repeated suffering, just words of accusation through acts of violence. We've got these wounds, these emotional wounds, right? And we've created a big denial system to protect those wounds, right? And so we need to receive 
truth, right? What Scripture says about us to break through the denial system. And at the beginning is that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. It's also that none of us, even our best works and efforts, can appease God's standards of righteousness and that everybody is heading towards judgment, right? And that God is so holy, He has wrath for injustice. He hates evil, right? And if you are outside of Him, judgment is going to come down on you. But because Jesus is the propitiation for us, He took our penalty for our sin. And not only that, He carried our sin and shame to the cross. The truth is the scalpel which opens the wounds. The truth gets behind and underneath the denial. First thing is we need a Savior. We need the blood of Jesus in our lives. Another illustration, let's say you were abused as a child. It happened years ago. It happened uh, decades ago. But you still have flashbacks. You still have memories of this thing which has happened to you. And the wounded mind wants to keep you captive, wants to keep you in shame. The wounded mind wants to keep you bound. Can you, are you beginning to see the influence of darkness in the wounded mind right now? It chases you and it whispers out at you. And it says, do you remember this? When you're in church, even. When you're praising God for His faithfulness, thanking Him for His forgiveness, your mind will somehow go back to a traumatic event in your life. That's not from God. That's not from you. That's from the devil. And so this thing which happened, right, some three decades ago still chases us around like a hound dog on our heels. We can't get away from it. We've got wounded, wounded minds. Why is that? Has anybody ever thought about that? Has anybody ever thought that trauma that we carry with us, it happened 30 odd, 20 something years ago, but it's just like it happened yesterday. Why is that? It's these wounded minds we have. These bodies of flesh that we have. The thing, what we need to hear, we need to hear truth. Somebody needs to hear truth this morning. That you are not the abuser. It is not your fault that you did not cause this to happen and you're not guilty for making or allowing or being involved in this, but your wounded mind wants you to live in shame. But the truth says it is over, it is finished, it is done. Walk in forgiveness and I will defend you, says God. Talking about spiritual warfare. We need to listen to one thing, and it's the voice of truth. So we open the wounds. We're going to go back to Nebuchadnezzar in just a minute. I'm talking about maybe what Nebuchadnezzar experienced. We see that pride was what set him up, pride rooted in fear. And we see that Nebuchadnezzar, although a king in Babylon, is not so different. So we take the truth, right? And the truth begins to pierce down into our hearts and, and it begins to expose the lies that we've believed, right? That we could earn salvation or that bad things were our fault that we've experienced, right? But truth begins to say, no, believe what He says to you. That He sets the captive free. So we've opened the wounds. Now we've got to clean the wounds. Remember I said you can't sit in front of Netflix seven days a week and expect to do spiritual warfare. You can't sit in front of Netflix seven days a week and expect to not live with the wounded mind. So we've used the truth to, to absolutely kind of like crack open the wounds. And now, now we need to do some really hard work. We need to clean those wounds, right? Which includes and involves and focuses upon our second thing, which is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ 
forgave you. We need to forgive those who have hurt us, not because they deserve it, and it doesn't excuse their behavior. No, but our healing comes through our forgiveness. Our healing comes through our forgiveness. We, we forgive because Jesus uh, forgave us. He did not excuse our sin. He carried our sin. And so we understand that. But ask, answer me a question. As I, why is it so hard to forgive? No, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise your hands, but, but my goodness. I, I mean, we, we forgive, 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 but then it's like right there, right? It's like it, it erupts and it erodes and it reappears in the, in the center of our imaginations, right? Why is it so hard for us as earth dwellers uh, having these physical bodies, right? Why is it hard for us to forgive? Because it's a battle of pride. It's a battle of pride. We're afraid. We're afraid that as soon as we forgive somebody, we immediately have to step down from the center of our hearts and minds and imaginations. We no longer become our our focus. We're no longer the martyr. We're no longer the central figure in this dynamic, right? When we forgive, we're saying that we effectively, we're bowing the knee to King Jesus to atone and, and to deal with this issue and this person, and I am removing myself. And as humans, we never want to remove ourselves. We want to build ourselves thrones, and we want to climb on them, and we want to sit on them. And we want to be our own gods. That's why we don't forgive. But it's through forgiveness that healing comes. And so what are we going to do? Here's some practical things. Turn off Netflix, get out a pen and paper, and write down a list of people that you need to ask for forgiveness for. People you need to ask for forgiveness for. And then... Ask them for forgiveness unless it's going to cause more pain, right? Unless it's going to cause more issues. Pray about it. Pray before you do it. Pray while you're doing it. Pray after you do it. Make sure you're following and and, and seek the counsel of others, right? There's safety in that. So we make a list of those we need to ask forgiveness for. And second, we make a list of those that we need to forgive. This is going to be the hardest part. I did this at Isaiah House. Some nine years ago, eight, I don't know, writing down a piece of paper with a pen, going back and searching your, your, your library for things that have happened to you that you're bitter because of or that you resent. You, you can still see people's faces just like you're looking at them right now. And you go through, you do this in much prayer, and you write down the names of those people that have hurt you. And you go through the list. You say, Father, I forgive them. They know not what they do. I forgive them. Look, this is not excusing them. This is not giving the rapist or the abuser a free pass, a free get out of hell card. No, it's not. It's taking your hands off of the issue and turning it over completely to God who delivers perfect justice. And realize this, whatever that person did to you has nothing to do with you. Whatever that person did to you has, has nothing to do with you. you. Oh my goodness. You didn't do anything to deserve it. You didn't do anything to bring it on. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. It has nothing to do with you. It's all about the other person who suffers from a wounded mind. Nothing to do with you. Let the shame go. Let the guilt go. It's garbage. It's, it's trash. Take, take all of that unforgiveness and throw it in the trash and start forgiving. You'll see miracles happen in your life. It may seem crazy, and yes, it's going to be difficult, but do it. And you'll see God move in a mighty way in your life. This is hard work. This is not somebody you can pay something you can pay a hundred bucks to a therapist for to do for you. This is something that you and the Holy Spirit are going to have to do. In recovery, we call it a running inventory. Sometimes we add to it when it's clean. We recognize it, we deal with it immediately, we move on. Talking about spiritual warfare, not the crucifix, 
Not throwing holy water. The real co-laboring with Christ. And so we see that forgiveness comes down and, and it cleans the wounds. And, and so now they've been exposed, they've been cleaned, and now we need the medicine to cover those wounds, right? And the third thing, the medicine, the shield that we need is perfect love, right? 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfect in love. Do you see what the Holy Spirit, do you see what God the Father is showing us here? He's setting apart two different extremes, fear and love. Fear leads to a wounded mind. Love leads to a powerful, sound, loving and calm, well-balanced, self-controlled mind. Perfect love cast out all fear. First, first Peter 4 eight says, above all, Above what? Yes. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. That's not a fake love. That's an earnest love. That's a man, I see your issues, but I'm going to love you, man. You've got a prayer request, I'm going to love you right through it. You're going through difficulty, I'm going to love you earnestly through it. It's, it's love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. Everything we're talking about. Abuse, humiliation, shame, idolatry, fear absolutely is all rooted in sin. The remedy, the medicine for this is perfect love. It's, it's God's love. The only medicine is love. But listen to this, right? Listen to this, right? We may believe that God loves us, yes, but we do not love ourselves. And so you're thinking, whoa, whoa, let's, let's back up. Let's walk back the love in yourself. Like, yeah, love God and, and, and love others. I'm cool with that. But when you talk about self-love, right, then it, things begin to get a little bit serious, a little bit idolatrous. They begin to get a little bit selfish. But let me explain to you something. What did Jesus say? Love your neighbors what? as yourself. Here's what we do. When, when, when we say, God, I thank you for loving me and I, I love you too, but, but I honestly, you know, I'm a little humble. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really like, I'm not prideful at all. I, 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 I really don't. I don't love myself, God, like I know you do. And what we in fact are telling God is that, God, my standards are higher than yours. And that's blasphemy talking about spiritual warfare, talking about the wounded mind. I'm talking about, guys, it's okay. It's absolutely okay to love your body, to love yourself, or God, to love and appreciate it because God has given. David said that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, right? It's okay to appreciate yourself. I'm not talking uh, in terms of priorities, putting yourself and placing yourself above God and above others. No, it should go to God, neighbors, and self, right? And so, but a, what a lot of us do, guys, I'm just going to keep it straight and narrow. What a lot of us do, we practice self-hate. I've got a scar on my arm. I mean, I knew it wasn't going to kill me, but man, the pain that I was feeling, I wanted to let it come out. Blade and bleed. I'm not the only one going on around us today. Cutters, self-mutilators. Guys, no doubt, when I put a needle in my vein, I wanted to hate come out. I wanted it to stop, right? We don't have a problem with loving ourselves. We have a problem with hating ourselves. We hate ourselves. We hate even the thought of us, the appearance of us. Now, not everybody. Somebody, some people really, really are way too in love with themselves, right? That's another sermon for another day. But I don't think we're over here, right? If I could speak honestly to the flock that God has planted us here with, right? I think for us, me especially, all of it, we're over here. We're a bunch of self-haters sometimes. 
And so we throw toxic poison down our throats and we put out these images in front of us and we've got these warped, wounded minds like Nebuchadnezzar out in the field in a strange place surrounded by strange people. We need perfect love. We need perfect love. We need perfect love this morning. We're so afraid of rejection, right? We're so afraid of rejection that we've, we've closed our hearts tightly. This is what we're dealing with. We are so afraid of not being accepted that we have closed down shop to our hearts. We've put up a stone wall. Um, it was a chain link fence, but now it is a pillar. It is a fortress that nobody is allowed to enter into. Talking about the wounded mind. Talking about we're starving for love. We're starving for love, for perfect love. Love without judgment. Love without having to earn it. And there's only one love that can provide that need, and it's the love of God. And this is the promised land. It's God's Spirit dwelling within you. So, here we are. How do we get here from the land of the dead, from the wounded mind, over to here, to where we're using truth, to where we're applying forgiveness, and we're walking in love? There's a gap. This is where it hits this morning. I like to ask Amanda if you begin to prepare to come to the to the piano and begin to prepare our, our, our altar call song. So, so a lot of us, right, we see, we recognize that, man, I, I've got a wounded mind. And so we see uh, through awareness is the first step to be aware that we believe some lies, to be aware that we've, living, uh, that we've lived in fear, right? And then that we've got to respond. In truth, to break open the wounds. In forgiveness, to cleanse the wounds. And then, in pure, perfect love, to cover and to heal the wounds. It's where we need to be. But this morning, some of us are in some graves. There's a story in 1 Thessalonians. It's a prophecy. It's a prophecy about the coming return of Jesus Christ. But it also holds more truth beyond that. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Guys, this is about the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is about resurrection morning. It's going to be a real event in the future, but also it can happen right here and now this morning. It can happen right here and now this morning and some of us are sleeping in our graves. We're sleeping in the grave of a wounded mind, right? But the resurrection is the return to loving life with pure love like that little kid at two and three years old did running around loving, not regretting yesterday, not worrying about tomorrow, not trying to earn love from anybody, not trying to fulfill a fall false image. No. Be an authentic love. A chasm exists. And God is calling you to step over. He's, he's appearing from the clouds this morning in a sense of by His Spirit through His Word. And He's appearing to you right now and He's saying, awaken, awaken, step out of the lies, rebuke the fear, and believe Me, says God, that I will redeem and restore you. Grave is the wounded mind. And the only reason we can turn, the only way we can return to life is when we see God's love back to Nebuchadnezzar. Just bear with me a couple more minutes. Back to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. And my reason returned to me. 
And I bless the Most High and praise and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Why did Nebuchadnezzar have his right mind restored? Because he looked to heaven and he seen the beauty, majesty, and love of God. Who is love? Uh, God. What is God? He's love, right? And Nebuchadnezzar sees this and he sees something else. That God is God and God is in control. And although he has a responsibility, Nebuchadnezzar, to live in a certain way, the ultimate outcome is not in his hands. Hands, it's in God. That's what we need to see, the love of God for us this morning. And in your minds this morning, uh, there's all kinds of emotional baggage and, and suffering and, and trauma. But I want to tell you this morning also that while that trauma and that suffering is there, that God is right there with you and He's waiting to uh, pour out upon you new life. He offers you an invitation to arise, to awaken, to come forth and to lay down the wounded mind and to walk with the mind of Christ. For second. Timothy 1 says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Can somebody give Him thanks and praise this morning? I'd like you guys, please just bow your heads and, and close your eyes for just a few moments. Maybe this morning the Holy Spirit has awakened your eyes to the lies that you believed and, and, and helped you and made you realize that everything you've been doing in life has been rooted in fear and you've bought into these false assumptions and these false expectations and these false obligations and you've constructed your life to please everybody else. You've constructed your life to avoid receiving guilt and shame. And what you're left with is just a fragment. What you're left with is just a poor image of who God has made you to be. And He saved you. Your soul is saved. And you've got eternity to spend with Jesus. But right now, you've got the keys to, to absolutely annihilate and crush hell. According to Romans 16, that's God working within you to crush hell. And what He wants to work in here this morning is our minds to bring forth that powerful, sound, loving, confident, well-balanced, and self-controlled mind. We can choose how we respond. We can walk away from here and say, man, that was a great message or that was a terrible message or we can critique it and go on to, to lunch, go on about our day and, and maybe watch a show and, and whatever tonight and tomorrow go on about our day forgetting what God has showed to us through His Word. But if you're serious about living in freedom, if you're tired, sick and tired of walking around with a wounded mind as a Christian, I'm here to tell you, you don't have to live that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Absolutely move towards Jesus as He calls you and moves towards you. Remember, always speak truth. Apply Scripture to your life. Saturate your heart with Scripture. Read it. Even when, if you hate reading, read Scripture. Maybe it's one chapter a day. Dig down deep into it. Begin to speak it right as you go to bed. When you wake up, don't believe what the world says. Our only defense is Scripture, is the Word of God, which tells us not only about God, but about ourselves. And it says that we're weary, heavy laden, that we're being attacked on all sides by the forces of darkness. But here's the good news. Darkness cannot win. Jesus Christ delivers the ultimate victory 
and He's inviting you into a space to live from that place of ultimate victory. Apply truth. Apply forgiveness. Always seek to forgive others and, and to be forgiven. And then in God's love, man, I'm talking about getting so immersed in the love of God that people see His light shining through your eyes, that your words that you speak are just so anointed with the Holy Spirit that chains are broken when you say hello because these things God has made available to those who seek Him, who love Him, who walk humbly with Him, who seek to do what is right. You've got a great future ahead of you, church. Psalm 23. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. And my cup overflows. Some of us here this morning need to have our heads anointed with oil. This means that it's the presence of God in our lives. It's not about the oil. It's symbolic. It's a symbol of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we've had these wounded minds don't get tired on me right now, church. Stay with me. We've had these wounded minds, right? And we believe these lies. We've jumped through these hoops. But right now, this morning, God is wanting to anoint our minds with His precious Holy Spirit. And so with every head bowed, every eye closed, I first want to issue an invitation to those who have never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, right? This is not just a one-time Thing where we come up here, we say, yes, I do, yes, I do, yes, I do, and then we walk away and we're good. It doesn't work like that. This is about giving your life to Jesus. This is not about gains. This is about life and death. This is about eternity, right? And maybe you're there getting waylaid by the enemy. Every time you turn around, another attack, another disappointment, another accusation. In Jesus Christ, there is no accusation. In Jesus Christ, there is no attack. He loved you so much that He died for you, that He carried your sin upon His shoulders. He received the just desserts for the punishment of sin, which was death, and He did that so you would not have to die. And so, if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, you want to give your life to Him. Repentance means metanoia. It means changing of the mind. It means changing from a wounded mind to the mind of Christ. If that's you, why don't you raise your hand and come forward this morning. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Make sure you don't leave here without having things right between you and the Lord. And for the second group of peoples, those of us who, who maybe have a suffered with a wounded mind, uh, I believe that we've heard the, the preaching of the Word and the Spirit of God has worked uh, co-laboring with His Word. And this morning, we, we need our minds touched. We need our minds touched by the Holy Spirit. As David said in Psalm 23, Thou anointest my head with oil. He makes, he prepares a table for me in the midst of my enemies. This morning we need our heads to be prayed over. We need the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and radically change us through the transforming of our hearts and our minds through the reading, the Word of God, the blood of Jesus, and the help of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to ask you guys to please stand across this sanctuary this morning. These altars are open here this morning. You can move at your own discretion, at your own pace, but I've got some oil up here. If anybody, I felt this before service, if anybody wants some prayer that, that like David said, that thou anoints my head with oil, literally, that was oil upon the sheep to keep the fleas and the gnats and the bugs and the pests and the parasite away. And I feel like maybe some of us are walking around with an effect of a parasite on our mind. If you want prayer, please come forward. I'll pray with you. We'll pray together. But church, now is the time.